Welcome to worship this morning. I want to start by asking you a few questions. What are you passionate about? What makes your blood boil? What ruffles your feathers or trips your trigger? What gets you talking and excited? We all have those things that, you know, somebody gets on a certain subject and, man, we jump right in, we charge right in. If you're someone who has passion, then you're going to be able to relate to the disciple that we're studying today. When you hear about the disciple James, he is always mentioned in concert with his younger brother, John, with the exception of one situation in the book of Acts that we'll get to in a little bit. But James and John were fishermen like their good friends who were also brothers, Peter and Andrew, that we covered the last couple weeks. These four made up the group that spent the most time with Jesus, and uh, all four of them were fishermen, and they worked for Zebedee. Now, for James and John, that happened to also be their dad. And they're often referred to as the sons of Zebedee, which seems to indicate that Zebedee was someone of some level of importance. In addition to being a businessman in other historical records and documents, there's an indication that Zebedee was from the tribe of Levi and may have been closely related to the high priest in Jerusalem at that time. That's a pretty significant connection. So when these disciples are listed, they're usually listed in this order, Peter, James, and John. And sometimes Andrew's a footnote. So even though Peter was the clear leader of this group, James was certainly another forceful personality in the mix. And, uh, and James may have even felt like he should have had a higher position than Peter because of those family connections that existed within the Israelite uh, nation. And that may be why James and John had their mother go to Jesus at one point and request that when Jesus came into his kingdom and did sit on his throne, that her boys would be the ones who sit on the right and the left. I can only imagine having my mother weigh in on something like that. But when the disciples are listed in Mark chapter 3, verse 16 through 19, there's a unique name that Jesus applies to this particular set of brothers. They were the sons of thunder. Listen to Mark 3, 16 through 19. It says, And he appointed the twelve, Simon, whom he gave the name Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. To them he gave the name Boanerges. Yeah, you heard that right, Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. And Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. That's the list. So we got a couple of nicknames here right at the beginning. You have Simon who was named Peter, which meant rock, and James and John who are called Boanerges, sons of thunder. I just have to say, Jesus gives out the most epic nicknames of all time. These guys could have totally been a wrestling tag team with the tagline, bringing the boom, right? The Sons of Thunder. That is James' personality for sure. He was zealous. He was thunderous. He was passionate and should not have been allowed to ever have a social media account. I mean, can you imagine the disciples in the, area of social, in, the, in the era of social media? It would have been a disaster. Last week, we heard about Andrew, who quietly took kind of the back seat, but brought people to Jesus one at a time, one-on-one, -on -one, and made a huge impact. James is a different personality. He is ready to rage against anyone who dared reject the Messiah. James was probably cheering when Jesus cleansed the temple, when Jesus rebuked the religious leaders, when demonic powers were cast down and defeated, and when Jesus cursed the fig tree for its lack of fruit. Yeah! However, 
there are times when our zeal or our passion can feel righteous, but it isn't. It's selfish or it's self-serving. It's a passion that destroys. And this is the kind of passion that Paul would later go on to describe in Romans chapter 10, verses 2 through 3. Paul wrote this, he said, For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God, they thought they sought to establish their own, and they did not submit to God's righteousness. See, the truth is we can be passionate about God, but still not really know his ways. And that seems to be where James and his brother, the, the sons of thunder, got carried away. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus is acknowledging that it's time to head toward Jerusalem for the Passover, his death and then his resurrection and his ascension, and standing between this group of him and his disciples and Jerusalem, their destination, was Samaria. Normally, Jews would go way out of their way to avoid Samaria. They would rather travel many extra miles and cross the Jordan River twice just so that they wouldn't have to deal with Samaritans. Now, why the bad blood? Because of bad blood. Literally, this was a race war. Samaritans were a mix of Israelites and Assyrians. And their religion was a hybrid as well. A little paganism, a little idol worship, a little truth. They feared the Lord, yet they served their own gods, according to the rituals of other nations, according to 2 Kings 17.33. So that meant they claimed to worship God and follow Old Testament scripture, but they established their own priesthood, they built their own temple, and they made their own sacrificial system. The Israelites and the Samaritans disagreed about virtually everything, including even just where the temple worship should take place. And that's why when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well, she tries to argue with Jesus about where worship should happen, here on Mount Gerizim in Samaria or at the temple mount in Jerusalem. You can only imagine how hostile Samaria would be toward anyone trying to travel through their land to Jerusalem. So you have the Samaritans who are hostile toward Israelites and Israelites who are disgusted by Samaritans. I'm sure that when Jesus told his disciples that they were heading to Jerusalem for Passover by way of Samaria, there was a little bit of frustration and tension and probably some groaning. Here's what happens in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of them, and they went and entered the village of Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. Jerusalem. A little prejudice there. But seeing that this group of Israelites was traveling to Jerusalem, there was no room in the inn for Jesus once again. The, the prejudice that they had was alive and well. And Jesus and his disciples, though willing to pay, they were a group of at least 13, but no one wanted to host them. A little later in the book of Luke, Jesus would tell the story of the good Samaritan who helped the Jew who had been beaten and robbed. But that was not the experience that Jesus and his disciples were having today. No, they were being unjustly discriminated against, and the sons of thunder were not happy about it. So listen to their suggestion from Luke chapter 9, verse 54. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, 
Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? I, I picture James with kind of a vein popping out of his forehead and, and these massive arms that are accustomed to pulling in nets full of fish are bulging under and, and maybe trembling under his tunic. I mean, Jesus never showed anything but kindness to Samaritans that he had encountered. And there had been many. And this is the thanks he gets? I get feeling mad and even offended. But seriously, who suggests this as a solution? Do you want us to call down fire from heaven? Let's destroy the entire town with the wrath of God's judgment. Now, for us, that idea probably seems like it's coming totally out of left field. But it has historical precedence. During the ministry of the prophet Elijah, he had confronted the Baal worship in this very place. And at one point, their king, at that time, King Ahaziah, had fallen through a lattice at his palace from his upper chamber, and he was seriously injured. Wanting to know if that injury would result in death, he consulted the fortune tellers of Baal. In 2 Kings chapter 1, Elijah is instructed by God to intercept those messengers who are going to get the fortune tellers, and he's given a word from God for them that the king will die from this injury. Now, they return with that, and the king hated Elijah, or Elisha, and he hates the message, so he sent a captain and 50 men to arrest him and probably eventually execute him. But when they showed up to collect him, they were consumed by fire from heaven. The same fate befell a second captain and his 50 soldiers. The third captain showed up with his 50 men and instead of suggesting anything about arrest, just simply begged for his life. So Elijah went with that captain and delivered his message in person. This was the big event that had happened in this town. It's not really a big surprise that this was on the mind of the disciples. For us, it would be like Kind of like going to ground zero of the Twin Towers, but not recalling what happened on 9-11. So when James and John make this outlandish suggestion, they probably see it as a somewhat fitting response to the hostility that they have encountered. They could justify, in their minds, this action. Now, obviously Elijah could not do something like this in his own strength or power. It must have been ultimately God's plan and an appropriate response to the death threat that he was receiving. But for James and John, this response comes with a great deal, I think, of pride and arrogance. They act like this is something they can totally choose to do. Jesus certainly could have done it if that's what he had wanted. He was more than capable. But James and John, I think, are interested in getting some credit and some notoriety. They had just been arguing about who was going to be greatest. Jesus, on the other hand, had already been attacked at times, ridiculed. Uh, taunted to make some display of his power at different points. And he always declined making a show of things. So I think James and John are basically asking Jesus to let them do what they know he won't do. We should never be asking Jesus to allow us to do something he won't do. See, Jesus isn't looking for people who will do his, quote, dirty work. He's looking for people who will emulate him. Elijah's mission 
was to speak truth to power and to confront that. Jesus, on the other hand, had a different mission. He did not come into the world to judge the world, but to save it. That's the John 3.17 to the John 3.16 that we all have heard, but John 3.17 is that he didn't come into the world to judge the world, but to save it. It's a very significant statement about what his mission was. And it gets reiterated in, in this passage here with James and John as well. So because of that, Jesus' response to the sons of thunder was to correct them. In verse 55, it says, But he turned and he rebuked them, and he said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. Isn't it interesting that Jesus just went on? And isn't that the kind of instruction Jesus had given to his disciples as well? If people don't receive you, just move on. You know, they'd been traveling with Jesus for almost three years. He'd been teaching them to be fishers of men. But their prejudice had taken over and blinded them from the spirit of what Jesus was teaching. Even though Jesus had every right to literally demand worship, he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's Matthew 20, 28. Now, this is not to say that Christ isn't coming back at some point to judge the world. We know that will happen. But in the meantime, we're called to serve the way he served and be willing to lay our lives down for the same message that he proclaimed. A message of freedom from the bondage of sin and salvation through grace. The message got through to James. You know, if this had been the only story about him, you might imagine that James eventually, in his demise, it came down to a battle royale, a showdown in a gladiator-style arena, uh, and, and a fight where he slays two dragons with his bare hands, you know, Samson-style, and, and he brings the boom. But actually, after Christ's death and resurrection, James' passion is no, no weaker but it began to mirror Christ's heart. So instead of a zeal for justice, it was a zeal for people to have a transformational encounter with Jesus. And this allowed him to have a peace and a steadfastness and even joy in the face of injustice. You know, often I think we'll find that God takes our weaknesses and turns them into our strengths. So now instead of a passion that destroys, in James we see a passion that transforms. James is the only one of the 12 disciples whose martyrdom is recorded in Scripture. He was the first of the 12 disciples to give his life for the gospel. And it's recorded in Acts chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It's a pretty short statement. It says, Now about that time, Herod the king, this is a different Herod than Jesus was born under, but Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. Not much there. A few things. If we dig into some more church history, and, and you can find these kind of things in like the, the works of Josephus or Fox's Book of Martyrs, there's some great resources out there that give us accurate accounts of other historical things. When you look into those, you find that, that it was actually James and another Christian man who were beheaded together. That other man was a very recent convert to Christianity. 
In fact, he had only declared his trust in Jesus moments before. He offered to die beside James after seeing the grace, courage, and joy that James had in the face of his own imminent death, an unjust death. This man had been James's sole accuser. He was the sole voice. Now, in Israel, that would have required two voices to accuse someone, but in this case, it was only one, and he was the sole voice that accused James of wrongdoing. He clearly did it for a political agenda, but was so startled by James's joy that he begged forgiveness and put his trust in Christ. James didn't call fire down from heaven to consume this man, but simply said, Peace be to you, brother. And he kissed him on the cheek. This is the kind of love and grace that can only come from the work of the Holy Spirit transforming our heart to be like Christ's heart. A work that happens in the life of those who are surrendered. Not less passionate, but surrendered. The man immediately refused to let James receive this crown of martyrdom alone and was chose to be beheaded next to the man whose powerful example caused him to turn to Jesus for salvation. Now, think about that for just a moment. James, in his proper passion for Christ, made such an impact in the life of his accuser that the man left home that morning thinking he was doing one thing and would just come back home that evening. And without ever going home or settling anything, he found something that he was willing to give his life for with no hesitation and no turning back. James' passion was contagious. Certainly this man had parents or siblings, maybe even a wife or children. But he was like the man that Jesus had talked about in the parable who found the treasure in the field. And without hesitation, recognized this was so significant that he was willing to give everything to buy in. To the kingdom of God. James's life certainly was thunderous. But it wasn't the battles he would fight. It was the powerful grace that he exuded that rocked those around him. If we, you and I, are going to live the life of a disciple, we can, and, and it's great to be passionate. But are we passionate about the right things? And are we passionate in the right way? Jesus is never asking us to rain down fire from heaven. He's not asking us to rain down words as a keyboard warrior on social media. He's called us to show radical love and radical grace to our world, the kind of love and grace that reconciles people to God. So how do we live that out? I just want to challenge you to really put some thought into that this week. That's where we're going to spend our time in Bible studies, is how do we live this out? How can you show radical love and grace to someone this week. Maybe God's already putting someone on your heart. Maybe it's even someone who you would ordinarily find it difficult to love. But I promise you, God can give you the grace to do it. 
God is not calling us to do his dirty work. He's more than capable. He's calling us to passionately lay our lives down in order to reach people for him. And that is a big part of what it means to live the life of a disciple. Lord, I just pray that you would call us out. I think sometimes it's easier to be passionate and rage against things than it is to passionately surrender. To passionately show grace and love to those who are hard to love or hard to show grace to. Yet this is the calling you put on each of our lives. And Lord, you do it so that you can radically transform and you can radically restore and and redeem. Lord, our, our world is in need of restoration and redemption. Lord, may we shine brightly for you. I just pray that, that wherever the Holy Spirit is convicting each one today, Lord, that you would just give them the courage and, and, and Lord, the grace to step forward and not look to, ser- to be served but to serve and to lay our lives down for your cause. Lord, there's so many things that get in the way of that and compete with that, but, but Lord... Give us pause just to reprioritize and refocus our lives so that our passion is not spent in vain, but used for your kingdom. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Uh, If you're not able to get out here on the lawn, we're, we're glad we can connect this way with you. Um, We are still doing services on the lawn on Sunday mornings at 1030. So uh, if you can make it to those, we'd love to see you. But keep, keep, uh, keep keeping on and keep pressing into the Lord. We'll see you soon. God bless.